Uh, Ezra, do you want to do you want to take this slide here and we get more into this bulls and ginta stuff? Yeah, yeah, let's do this. The evidence is the extraction of labor no longer a problem. In the case of cooperatives, bulls and gintas have argued that if workers were the owners of the assets, the problem of monitoring enforcement of work effort would be dramatically transformed. The problem of extracting labor effort would not disappear because there would still be free rider problems among the worker owners. But since in worker cooperatives, there are stronger incentives for mutual monitoring than in conventional capitalist firms. And since the motivation of actors are likely to strengthen anti-free rider norms and identities, the cost of monitoring should go down and thus productivity would increase. This, this reminds me of an article that I read recently that was about hunter-gatherer societies and just mm. how strong their monitoring of free riders is. Like, even though they don't really have, like, situations of extreme scarcity or anything like that, they're, they're such strong collective norms uh, against that kind of behavior that you might expect to see the same sort of thing in a cooperative the similar kind of uh, motivation structure, right? Assu assuming the cooperative is set up properly, and you can't just like take the money and run, right? I, I think there's a like an example from I've heard. I don't know. I can't remember the source who said it, but it was like you know. I think it might have been somebody who had like brought like some a particular different type of fruit, you know, like a, a an anthropological researcher or something had brought like I don't know a goddamn apple or something and when he, he gave it to the, the people in the group and there was 16 of them there and they are, or maybe it's a tomato and they cut the tomato into 16 equal segments. So they all get this tiny sliver of tomato, but it was really strictly enforced. You yeah. know, everything yeah. had to be equal. But um, I've personally experienced this now in where I used to work, where my father worked was, it was a, not a worker owned co-op, but it was a farmer owned co-op. And they had like mm -hmm. workers in the cooperative doing the milk and, you know, the manufacturing kind of, of, of cartons of milk, two liters and cream and stuff. But like it was very much like there was very little enforcement of work effort. It was all very much like if it ne things needed to be done, people would stay late and do things. It had a very, very different ethos, much different than any other place I've worked. It's the only co-op I've worked in and wasn't even worker owned. So I think this is definitely true for me. Yeah, and it, it's so different from the, the the classical image of the Soviet worker who is like the the you know history's greatest free rider. Like, you know, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. Just, you know, drunk on the job with the state liquor and producing as little as possible and then like doing a frenzy of production to meet quotas at the end of the period and yeah, like all that kind of stuff. It's, it's a very, very different image from uh, what you're describing there, Tom. I mean, I, yeah, well, the class relations, it would <coughs> it makes complete sense. They don't feel like... Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing... What? Yeah, it's so confusing. Why, why would they feel like they don't well, own the tractor? Why, yeah, yeah. why would they feel like exactly. they own the tractor? Everybody you owns the tractor. spend most my life living in a worker's paradise. Have any of you seen that? Like, there's an amazing clip of, like... Uh, of a Russian miner being interviewed back in the 90s about like is it true that like Russian miners are just like turning up to work and they're drunk all the time and he's at, trying to answer seriously and in the background some Russian drunk guy miner just like stands up and his like face is covered in soot he, he's obviously just like fallen over and he he's trying to like I'm on, I, I'll see if I can find it it is unbelievable it is like you you got to respect the Russian miners who are getting so drunk on the job because I've never seen anything like it in my in my entire life. It was fucking is, phenomenal. That is, that is, Can't even keep it together long enough to smile for the news cameras. Oh, my God. No, uh, uh, <laughs> right, Bolton Gintis uh, eventually <laughs> believed that uh, socialism, and, and mar including market socialism, can't work because of this free rider problem. So they, they galaxy brained themselves into uh, becoming post-socialists. Yeah, they but they they did so at about the same time the, the wall fell. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because Bowles was at the Marxist economics conference that I went to in Japan. Um, yeah, he was he was part of the I think he was part of the original analytical Marxist or not yeah he, but like the, the name brand uh, September Group and an, analytical Marxists. Yeah, but he he was he was still kind of like. 
everybody, I remember everybody was talking about like, man, how did this guy get to be such a square? But at the same time, he was still sort of talking about like collectivist stuff about like, you know, pro-social behaviors and that kind of thing <laughs> using like agent models and that kind of yeah, stuff. He did, no, he did. The thing I love about Bulls and Gintis, because I, I came to him before I even met Esri uh, in my oh, cooperative God. research uh, in psychology. The thing I love about them is that, like, despite being post socialists, they're still, like, very much, like, all their research is very, I think, incredibly crucial for, like, social cooperation. And, and stuff about social cooperation is very crucial mm. for some kind of uh, bottom up socialism. Yeah, they have this, yeah. like, evolutionary, egalitarian standpoint, which, like, honestly, can go some pretty dodgy places. It seems like Herbert Gintis has gotten pretty post left if his Amazon reviews are any. Anything. Uh, like uh, yeah, it seems no. like, like Gintis no. is the real square yeah, of the if, pair. If you want to see it, it's like Gintis say white lives matter in a thing. Or, or no, it, it's all lives matter, he was saying. Yeah, because right. Oh, okay. It's, it's better. It, yeah, he's, he's a fucking chud. Yeah, I thought it was white lives matter, though, so it was worse. It was worse in my head, but you know, <coughs> it's still bad. Are you ready for these drunken Russian miners? No, yeah. for something completely different. Not for know. something wholesome. Not obeying Soviet production quotas. I think it's got subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a lie. <laughs> we hate vodka. Oh, oh sure? no! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh no! Oh no! I feel for I feel for that guy. I feel for that guy. Employees in an employee-owned firm are embedded in a different set of class relations than are employees in a conventional capitalist firm, and this variation affects the labor extraction process. You know, it's just amazing that Wright had to make these points, or felt that these were points that needed to be made. And if you read sociology, they desperately do need to be made. But can you imagine, I don't know, can you imagine the patience of somebody that has to make these points professionally? I, I think it, uh, things would operate uh, kind of differently if workers own stuff. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure there are some Marxists that would, you know, are, are you the value form is blah, 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 whatever. But I, I, anyway, these things just seem, I'm just, I'm happy this guy was in the trenches. I don't know. Capitalist firms within which workers have effective rights to their jobs are also a case of transformation of class relations within production. Such a situation poses specific problems for the employer. On the one hand, by making it harder to fire workers, strong job rights reduce the efficiency of monitoring and make shirking easier. But this constraint on firing also makes the time horizons of workers with respect to their place of employment longer and may make them identify more deeply with the welfare of the firm. Which of these two forces is stronger depends upon the details of the institutional arrangements that regulate the interactions of workers and employers, the research on the implications for cooperation and productivity of strong job rights in Japanese and German capitalism can be considered instances of class analysis of principal agent problems. David Gordon presents evidence for a strong inverse relation between the degree of cooperation and the labor management relations of a country on the one hand and the weight of its administrative managerial employment on the other. The correlation between an index of cooperation and the percentage of administrative and managerial employment was negative 0 0.72 for 12 OECD countries. Explain that to us then, Esri. The strong inverse relation between the degree of cooperation in labor management of a country on the one hand and on yep. the other, the weight of its administrative managerial employment. Yeah. One number goes up, <laughs> other number goes down. Yeah, that's a, that's a strong inverse relationship. So the more, like, the more that there is uh, cooperation in labor management, the less there is the weight of administrative managerial employment. Yeah, so the reason that the, so uh, yeah, correlatively, and then, you know, I feel my, Political instincts kick in. And feel there's a strong causality here, but where where there's cooperation, there's less management. Where there's more management, there's less cooperation. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because like my uncle 
in the Netherlands works in South America and he basically goes around like making this point. He's like, y'all should cooperate more. It's more efficient. Like this, you know, like, but by having class conflict, you're really just, you know, putting a break on your whole thing. Like you should be more like the Dutch, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, that's his whole job basically is to break this point. It's interesting. I was interviewing like yeah, a woman about the communes in Venezuela and she was saying, you know, there's this firm that has like, I don't know, like 50 workers or something. And they, they meet up for like half a day once every month to decide everything. And that's sufficient. They don't need any other meetings. Oh, that <laughs> sounds know? so lovely. Oh, my God. It's paradise. Yeah. Right. I am spending the most money. No, I, I, I really kind of wonder like how much, <laughs> I don't know, like I, I've heard stuff about the Venezuelan communes. I really wonder, like, is it? I mean, this is, this is, this is, this is one particular (laughs) one, I think. (laughs) I can totally believe that within the, but no, I can totally believe that there are like some instances of like commune, communes that were set up by the government that are actually pretty cool. Like it's not impossible to think. They're not really set up by the governments. They're actually like the ones that are interviewed, like the ones that have any set, usually set up by themselves. And they get some protection under some law, legal stuff. For example, like the one that interviewed. That's even more believable to me. Yeah, honestly. like the one that yeah, interviewed. Yeah, they're, they're, they're they had right. a law like the Chilean had in the 1973 revolution, whereby if a, if a if firm was not using their stuff and you know trying to go on a class strike, that the workers could take over the firm, and they fought like fuck to take over their firm for like two years and slept in it and it was really hardcore and like these are the factories that are running it like it's not like these aren't communes that are set up from the government but they do have some protections under law you know but like it shows you that the the differences in the in like the differences in how you need to organize and the work is very dependent upon the class relations in the work i think that's the major point though what do they have in japan isn't it like they have like the window jobs is that is it the window jobs kyle it's less of a thing now, but yeah, that's absolutely something that existed. Yeah, so if you, because they had this lifetime employment system, if you were somebody who was basically unsuited for your job, right? Like, I don't know, maybe you're neurodivergent, maybe you're just, you know, hard to work with, maybe you are you keep fucking things up, like who could say? But essentially the solution to this problem was to give you a desk by the window and like socially ostracize you. So you have nothing to do at the job. You just go in and sit at your desk all day and then you go back home because they can't fire you and your coworkers aren't going to fire you, but you're kind of in their way. You're a problem for them. Like you shouldn't be there. And so you just become completely socially ostracized within this full employment scenario, right? And so, yeah, it was it was basically like a living hell for these people who had to, uh, you know, collect a paycheck, yes, but basically live in a kind of daily imprisonment. So that was like a weird, like perverse outcome of the lifetime employment system uh, that, you know, to some extent still exists in Japan, but it's... It's it's a much it smaller a proportion. 90s, right? What's that? It didn't it change like a bunch in the nineties? The economic yeah, 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 yeah. It of... did with the bubble bursting and stuff. And essentially, what's happened with the labor market in Japan is that there is a smaller proportion of the workforce that has lifetime employment at large corporations. You know, they're they're employed by big capital. They get fairly well compensated and then there is a much larger than there used to be casualized workforce that moves around a lot uh, is like super exploited and that has like essentially they have borne the burden of like the fallout of the bubble bursting in order to keep japanese capital going while still uh maintaining a fairly high degree of exclusion of immigrants, even though there's also a part of the the workforce that is made up of immigrant labor. And that has become 
larger since I think it was about like mid 2010s. They relaxed the immigration laws. So you see like now if you go to Japan, pretty much all of the convenience stores are staffed by um, immigrants as opposed to uh, Japanese people. And that was like quite a big change that happened in the time that I was there that you can just sort of see in daily life. So yeah, essentially there was a split, like going from a fairly egalitarian society to a two-tier society that is, relatively speaking, still fairly egalitarian, <laughs> despite maintaining all kinds of like hereditary privilege across generations through like, you know, the personal networks and educational achievements and, and et cetera, et cetera. Like you still, you still meet people who are be like, oh yeah, my family were samurai, blah, blah, blah. And, all this kind of thing, or we were nobles. Um, all that kind of stuff still exists under the surface, but the actual absolute levels of inequality are relatively low in Japan compared to other countries. They've just become worse. And that's the Japanese labor market. Sophia, do you want to take this slide? Sure. The evidence. Does class location no longer matter? Does classification no longer systematically affect individual subjectivity? Bukowski and Waters are on their strongest ground when they argue class is not a powerful source of identity, consciousness, and action. Wright's research on class structure, biography, and consciousness in the 1980s indicate that in most of the countries studied, class-related variables were only modest predictors of values. In Sweden, individual class location by itself explained about 16% of the variance in a class consciousness scale, while the U.S. the figures were the figure was only 9%, and in Japan only 5%. When a range of other class-linked variables were added, including such things as class origins, self-employment experiences, unemployment experience and the class character of social networks, this increased to about 25%, 16%, and 8%, respectively. In all three countries, these class effects were statistically significant, but not extraordinarily powerful. The explained variances in these equations are not particularly low by the standards of regressions predicting attitudes. In general, it is rare for equations predicting attitudes that have high explained variances unless the equations include other attitudes as independent variables, e.g. using self-identification on liberalism conservatism scale as a way of predicting attitudes towards specific public policies. Part of the reason for this is undoubtedly the, the pervasive problem in Adequately measuring attitudes, a significant part of the total variance in measuring attitudes may simply be random with respect to any social determinants. It is hard to manage a multivariate regression rooted in social structure vari variables that would predict that Engels, a wealthy capitalist, would be a supporter of a of revolutionary socialism. Class often performs as well or better than many other social structural variables in predicting a variety of aspects of attitudes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I could imagine like a like a model that would predict an angles because you just you know you have like a small percentage of being a contrarian, or you have like a you build in like an empathy, like a, <laughs> an empathy. This is this is like nice foundation empathy. shit we're talking about here now. <laughs> to be fair, psychohistorians only predict man masses, not individuals, not an angles in particular. So fairy, fair, 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 fair. But yeah, only the yeah. likelihood of an angles. God rolled a natural yes. twenty on on angles empathy calculation, and angles was like, oh, <laughs> "Fuck this English fucking child labor shit. This sucks." The old angles nat twenty. Yeah. So uh, this is really interesting, right? Because I mean, I, I I think in in terms of Japan, there's a there's a lot of things that militate against class consciousness. One is that the Gini coefficient in, in Japan is actually quite biased towards 
equality, even though like because the so it's weird because relatively speaking, Japan is quite equal. But because the Japanese economy is so large, you know, compared to somewhere like Canada, you still see a lot of people like driving around in like Ferraris and stuff, you know, like it's, 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 it's like you have to hold those two facts in your head, right? Like if you are relatively well off in a fairly equal country, but the absolute pie is so large like you're still going to be pretty damn rich compared to other places. Right. Like what's um, the Gini coefficient of Luxembourg? Right. Like, <laughs> like how, how much yes, do you yeah. have to even like be a citizen of Luxembourg? And so it kind of makes it Luxe- Luxembourg a trolls evil. unite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Monaco trolls out here. Oh wow! Well, well, there you I, go. I, I really don't know. I, I like I was sort of kidding, but like you know, I don't know that much about Luxembourg other than the price of membership. So it's the members yeah, only club. The, the, the Grand Duchy. You can see you can see quite a few markers of class in Japanese society, such as owning Ferraris or Rolexes, dining at really swanky restaurants, all that kind of stuff. But people don't have a very strong class consciousness, even if you add in that sort of like hereditary privilege, intergenerational wealth thing, because of the land reform that the Americans did after World War II and the support that they gave to the socialists and communists in the sort of post-war arrangement, because the, the people who were originally running the occupation were basically socialists. And that like, you know, really push Japanese society in collaboration with Japanese, like, left intellectuals, etc., in a fairly egalitarian direction. They were also one of those border countries between the Eastern and Western Bloc. That helped, too. And then you have things like people will have different class standings, but they will live in the same neighborhood. So there's there's not a really strongly segmented geographical division between classes. And so all of these things together mean that class consciousness in Japan is fairly low, even if you come into the society as a Marxist, you can see class everywhere. Uh, I guess that's what I was trying to say. It's like, it might seem strange, but there are reasons for it. If you look at that point about, you know, class being, or sorry, property relations being quite a weak determinant of attitudes, it really does point in that sort of direction of like, like Mouffe and Laclau, right? Of like, you know, just being like hyper Leninists where like it's all, all political determinism and the economic part is just kind of thrown, thrown out. Because, yeah, your class location is not actually a very strong predictor of your political affiliation, according to this sort of research. But your profession is, like, according to the, another chapter of the book, and the, the real class, the real classes are these bundles of, of, like, different, you know, types of employer, types of, you know, petty proprietor, types of... Right, so employer. there's... That's the real being determines consciousness, class. And yes. Role. So instead of being a dumbass Leninist who's like, that's essentially abandoning materialism as a cause. Yes. No. Absolutely. Absolutely, they do. Like Luke, yeah, uh, Luke and Laclau like, completely abandon materialism. They've sort of just abandoned, you know, the scientific kind of ground for understanding how class yeah. impacts consciousness. Like, yeah. And and. But that that that's also really interesting that like essentially class like class consciousness is a it's kind of like a corporate thing more than a class thing because it, it, it depends it depends a lot on which group you are in in that class, what your consciousness is gonna be, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it, it's well, the, it's the, very the unevenly Marxist, distributed. The Marxist version of class consciousness assumes that you're going to class consciousness is like this limit that grows to its like broadest, like most, mm. you know, coolest universalist humanist like 
like uh, version of, of a construction of it. I like to call it the long term, yeah. you know, the long view, like yeah. of classic dress, because I because I, I do think it like captures something real. That, yes, yeah, in the long run, like it would be better even for. The, I mean, you know, like, I, I don't know, you could go too humanist, like, with this, but, like, yeah, I don't know, in, in the long run, it's clearly better for workers if, you know, they didn't have to live in a society dominated by their employers, like, <laughs> like yeah, 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 but, uh, yeah, anyway, it's just, a, it's, it's an interesting point for us to continue to pay attention to going through this, because, you know, this is going to be significant. Okay, Kyle, hit the next section, then. All right, does class location no longer matter, part two? Does class location no longer systematically affect individual subjectivity? The second thing to note in these results is the very large cross-national variation in the explanatory power of class variables for predicting individual attitudes. There are interesting variations in specific ways class locations and attitudes are linked in the three countries, Sweden, the U.S., and Japan. In Sweden, the class structure is quite polarized ideologically between workers and employers, and there is a fairly large middle class coalition, in quotes, that is ideologically quite distinct from the bourgeois coalition and from the working class coalition. So these would be, you know, I guess your sort of Lib Dem types if it was like UK politics. In the U.S., the class structure is less ideologically polarized, and the bourgeois ideological coalition extends fairly deeply into the structurally defined, quote-unquote, middle class. Managers and professionals are firmly part of this coalition. So, like, you know, there is, there, there is a wide swath of bootlickers in the U.S. is, is the point that we're, we're getting at there. In Japan, there's a third configuration. Ideological polarization is much more muted, and the ideological divisions that do occur fall mainly along the expertise dimension rather than the authority dimension of the class structure. Yeah, there was an interesting thing that I remember from being in Japan where there was a professional family. I, I was teaching a student whose, whose parents were from a professional family, and their parents had voted communist in the election because they have like, you know, this MMP system. So it, it kind of favors communists getting seats and stuff. And the reason they gave for that was actually sort of a, a charitable one. They were like, oh, like, you know, we vote for the communists because like the construction workers and stuff, they really need like somebody to speak up for them. And like, you know, they need to they need, they, you know, like, you know, they, they need some advocates, like, you know, good for the little guy kind of stuff. It's is very non politicized support for the communist party. Uh, it's sort of what I saw there. And these patterns of variation demonstrate that the linkage between class location and individual subjectivity is heavily shaped by the macro social context within which it occurs. Class locations do not simply produce forms of subjectivity, they shape subjectivity in interaction with a range of other processes, institutional arrangements within firms, political strategies of parties and unions, and historical legacies of past struggles, etc. These complexities certainly do undercut any simple-minded class analysis that asserts something like class determines consciousness. But they do not undermine the broader project of investigation of the ways in which class in interaction with other social processes has consequences. So, yeah, I mean, the essential point here is that, like, you need to be more materialist, not less materialist, right? Like, you need to understand, like, what does class actually look like in a quotidian sense for people as opposed to just sort of asserting a class interest in a very broad categorical way and then expecting that to have a very simple effect on political attitudes. Right. Yeah, if you're talking if you're talking about consciousness, you know, it's just a much more fine grain thing than you know, Marxists like to talk about like collective Hegelian consciousness instead of like like the 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 historical mission of the working class, etc. Yeah, you know the big brain yeah. you have with everyone with the same stuff as you. Oh wow, how yeah, Hegelian! The, 
Seriously, the, the, it's so hard to sleep when you like their brains connected. You know? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm just trying to regenerate, and I hear all you know everyone and else chattering. chattering in my head. Yeah, shut up! Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Red and Stimpy, <laughs> Red and Stimpy, always with Red and Stimpy. You know, it just gets. I mean, head. I mean, y'all, y'all are laughing, but like that's why you. You know, you can't get Twitter. to sleep when there's like too much Twitter and YouTube going on. That's why I gave up Twitter. Like, it's interesting here that, I, I that mean, the things he like, didn't mention. That's like, that's scary. It's I'm sorry, but it's scary, Kyle, because like, what what are the positive like Hegelian expressions of that kind of cybernetic? <laughs> <laughs> because I can really only think of the Baudrillardian like dead ends. Yeah, there. it's quite interesting here that he never like the three the three societies he chose sweden us and japan you'd probably say you us and japan have are like empires and have a kind of an imperial history too he doesn't kind of bring that into his analysis at all what do people think about um the well but but tom the 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 configuration of japanese society changed so radically after the war that it's such a strong historical break that you can't really reason about the structure of Japanese society in terms of what its empire looked like, even though it has a like privileged role within American empire. It does have an economic imperialist dimension that you absolutely can see. It's just like the pre-war society of Japan was so different to what ended up happening after the war with the land reform and stuff that like, these are very, very, very different countries. And you see this with like Japanese, sorry, Japanese American communities that relate back to Japanese society. And like, they just, they're, they, they, it feels like so alien to them because they have like residual culture from before essentially the revolution and you know the the post-war japan is just a completely different country in so many ways would it be fair to say it's nearly closer now to its kind of like feudal past than its imperial past uh no no the way they talk here about the uh things are more defined by by expertise rather than ideological uh, just i'm just I, I i have no idea i just i'm just throwing it out it, there it, well i think what you see there is essentially like it's kind of like japan is a lot more similar to post war europe in the sense that like western europe right in the sense that like you essentially still had fascists running the country but within the context of like the sweeping land reform that happened and empowerment of socialist parties. So there was like a lot of class compromise that happened, but also just like so much empowerment of the lower classes that had never existed before in Japanese history. And, and a lot of, and a lot of the stuff in Japan was like trying to consciously emulate European social democracy while also like maintaining imagined elements of the agrarian past of, of the country. Yeah. So it, it's, it, it's, it's fairly similar to patterns you see in Western Europe after the war. I, I would listen to your Japanese history and, and economics podcast. Like, same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, like, okay. I, I just have one thing I want to say about this. This is really cool. And interesting is that like people now in Japan, like who came up through the conventional Japanese education system, like they literally cannot read Japanese from before the war unless they have special training to do so. That's how big the social dislocation was. Like what do you mean? Like just the vocabulary is different, or like yeah, yeah, like the the, the the way the way it's written is completely changed like the language changed in a very dramatic way as a result of the sort of revolutionary uh changes i used to know more about the specifics but i and that's something i remember talking to uh my colleagues at kyoto university i was like wait like why do you need like special training to study something that's like from like 1930s 
And it's like, oh yeah, like J Japanese is different from like most modern languages in that even modern Japanese is bifurcated into pre and post-war Japanese. Wow, like what, what's the Insane. like Japanese name for the this like revolution or period change like after the war? Uh, yeah, they would just, they would just call it like the post-war, like single, like po the post-war. And, and you get people who were sort of born, like, who were like children just before the war. And they'll sort of, like my old advisor would go on a lot about this kind of thing. Like be like, you know, you, 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 you youngins, you have no idea what Japan used to be like. You have no idea what the old country was like before the revolution, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the revolution, huh? Wow. Um, I mean, it, nobody talks about it as a revolution, but effectively, it, it was a revolution without a revolution, you know? The change was that dramatic. It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A revolution from above. Just the type we like. <laughs> <laughs> Final slide. Let me hit it. I'll do this one. Complexity versus disillusion. It certainly seems premature to declare the death of class. Class may not be the most powerful or fundamental cause of societal organization, and class struggle may not be the most powerful transformative force in the world today. Class primacy as a generalized explanatory principle across all social explananda is implausible. However, Class remains a significant and sometimes powerful determinant of many aspects of social life. In denying the significance of these kinds of empirical observations, Pekulski and Waters seem to be mistaking the increasing complexity of class relations in contemporary capitalist society with the dissolution of class altogether. While it was never true that a simple polarized two class model of capitalism was sufficient to understand the effects of class unconsciousness and action in concrete capitalist societies, there were times and places where perhaps this was a reasonable first approximation. For most purposes, this is no longer the case and a variety of forms of complexity need to be added to the class analysis. Middle class locations need to be given a positive conceptual status, for example, by treating them as a contradictory locations within class relations. The locations of individuals within class structures need to be defined not simply in terms of their own jobs, direct class locations, but also in terms of the ways they are linked to mechanisms of exploitation through family structure, mediated class locations. Class locations have a specific temporal dimension by virtue of the ways in which careers are organised. And finally, the diffusion of genuine ownership of capital assets among employees if still relatively limited, creates additional, additional complexity in class structures, since some people in managerial class locations and even some in working class locations can simultaneously occupy locations in the capitalist class as rentiers. This constitutes a special form of contradictory location within class locations. Okay, to conclude, class analysis needs to incorporate these and other complexities. The reconstruction of class in these ways, however, does not imply the disillusion of the causal processes that class theory identifies. These complexities may lead to a conceptual framework that is less tidy and that perhaps evokes less fiery passions. But in the end, the contribution of class analysis to emancipatory projects of social change depends as much on its explanatory capacity to grapple with the complexity of, of contemporary capitalist society as on its ideological capacity to mobilize political action. Okay, thoughts? I'm, I'm not actually sure that a, like a realistic class analysis that sort of takes into account the noisiness of society would lead to uh, less fiery <laughs> outcomes ideologically. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that is a uh, a sort of Churchillian like nonsense, like that this this idea that like well, if you're more realistic, you're less uh, less fiery, right? Like, it, 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 I I just don't think those two things actually go there's together. A, there's at least a correlation between people who think of themselves as like you know 
class warriors and people who just think of things as it's all bourgeois and proletariat, man. Like, you know, like there, there is like an ideological reason to break things down like that. <laughs> yeah well the other thing i was thinking of was like how they got rid of the gothic script in germany after the war that's a similar phenomenon right they also uh, got for, rid of for the listeners the the comment was so basically japanese is hot is hebrew uh <laughs> with regards to the sort of linguistic div of divide yeah, the, the resuscitation of Hebrew is like pretty much historically unprecedented. Very strange. Very particular cultural context. That makes sense, Ezri, like the point you were making. I, I was just thinking like, you know, there's actually things that can be quite infuriating that you can discover through like a realistic analysis of, of class, even if it doesn't yeah. make you into a sort of like, you know, that like fervent, uh, the, the, the fervor of the newly converted kind of zealot. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I agree with your point overall, because like when you get a sense of how unfair things are and you really see your location on the anthill and like, and you're, you understand exploitation. If you're like a pro-social hopeful person, you're like, all right, who do I team up with? Take this motherfucker out. Like, yeah, I think, like, this is the kind of stuff that it can let a fly under ass, like, knowing the complexities and still seeing, like, how awful and, and, and unequal things are. But I think in, like, a very literal sense of, like, mobilization, you know, what kind of slogan can we get out of this? <laughs> the middle class is a contradictory location within class locations. Yeah. No, uh, reading this, I, I, like, uh, somebody we were talking to kind of suggested that this book was a break from his previous work on class. And I think that's totally misreading. It's like trying to take some of his like more empirical and like super zoomed out work or like kind of quant oriented class work into like more qualitative kind of theoretical territory. And like, it's just sort of, it's more building on as a, cause contradictory class location, something <laughs> comes, it's like a fucking terrible freight phrase he comes up with. Probably like just after he was like a Maoist or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, and one of the two. One yeah, of the two. I don't know. It's that definitely has the Marx speak on it. Like we could do better than contradictory class locations, but like you kind of know what he means. Like it's you have to yeah. you have to think about the complexity yeah. of class analysis because uh, yeah, like yeah. There, there is there is someone who like works at like a fast food joint and is like a pet, a very small landlord or something like. They're, like that person exists. Like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's it's just like you were talking about with the the self employed workers, right? Like, there is a contradictory motivation there. I I think it's true though that like it does make slogan hearing harder, and that may be one reason why there's such a strong temptation towards nationalism, because you can talk about the people uh, as opposed to these like specifically located class situations that 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 right is uh, zeroing in on here but I, I think one of the things as well is like that with like you know all of the stuff of the class compromise after the second world war being you know very much if not totally gone on the way gone that we're you know we're going to see uh workers be in a situation that is analogous if not to say you know not to say exactly the same to like workers that you know to pre the unionization drives so we will likely see the i i i feel like these the weakening and the strengthening of these ideas of of, of how people of how the effectiveness of class class and the impact of class itself in society is likely to be associated with long waves of action so uh i don't have a kind of a Nikon opinion about like you know it's dis it's dissolved now and that's it that's it done so some of the hey, actual hey, the the, the Nikons are super big on uh on class structure stuff just like not class consciousness leading to age right consciousness right. is fractured in a way that's very uncomfortable to socialists like and that's true like th and that's true for reasons that like and notes goes into about the dissolution of this the the industries that created the kind of labor compacts that that right likes 
Wright likes these labor compacts. Right. Yeah. You know, kind of wishes we could do that again. That'd be cool. But it, it, to me, I, I kind of think about it in the kind of, you know, this idea like in kind of military history where somebody has a new tactic or a new a new weapon and they can just fucking blast everybody and it takes a long time for op opposition to, what's the word I'm for Kyle here? To adjust, adjust yeah, strategy. Right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes they even get very low. You see like sometimes, you know, uh, very low cost <laughs> people that shouldn't be able to withstand like the most uh, most powerful empire can find very low cost ways to fucking up the, the imperial power so there's all these different things that play in over time that's just something uh, you know uh, i i feel like I, that the importance of of knowing the 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 how the class works in the micro level is probably most important in the times when we are weakest as a kind of a movement yeah but i think that there's some things, for example, like Ezra, you kind of mentioned earlier in this podcast, like uh, the, the lo this point about the locations of individuals within class structures needs to be defined not simply in terms of their own jobs, but also in terms of the ways they are linked to the mechanisms of exploitation through family structure. So, right. cool. you know, talking right. about like left politics and people who come from trust fund backgrounds mm -hmm. um, becoming communists, uh, uh, you know, this... This kind of micro stuff does matter, even you know, in an upswell, because what you get in in an upswell is this. This happens in every revolution. Is like when the revolution becomes a, a political wave. Well, the the most ambitious people will join the revolutionary cause, right? Because they're they're opportunists. And they're they're just going to look for whatever group has the power in society, and uh, yeah, oftentimes they are these people who uh, have these uh, these uh, wealthy uh, backgrounds. But uh, uh, you know, if you look at their local situation, they're, they're you know they're the purest uh, you know right. professional revolutionaries. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting on on a kind of a similar way, but obviously not as yeah as interesting a way. We see the same process happening in Ireland with Sinn Fein, where they're becoming like the dominant party, and we're uh, seeing yeah. like people that are coming into Sinn Fein now that would have been uh, in from say like the Fianna Fáil party, and you know they're changing their colours and they're getting like it's kind of establishment kind of they're slowly gathering an establishment kind of a a feel around them, which is very interesting to see. Because mm -hmm. like they are, mm -hmm. they are the enemy, but then they get so strong. It's like, ah, oh, well, you are our friend, you know, at a certain stage. Yeah, right. That's, That's when the, the opportunists come. You have the okay, early but... political entrepreneurs, like long-term opportunists, and then you have, you know, your your mid mid Johnny come Yeah, like yeah, kind of stuff. I'm sure. I'm here, here, but here, here is the thing about the opportunists. Uh, like, if I've, if I've, I don't know, I, I've sort of tried to think about this a lot, like listening to, you know revolutions podcast and the opportunists are often actually quite effective revolutionary leaders even if they are like even if they are riding the wave um because the wave is so strong that they end up being revolutionary you know it's like yeah you have to wait for the ab in the time like the, the these are these are these are like politically talented people who see an opportunity to use their talents and that could be very self-interested and destructive but in some circumstances like they are actually effective revolutionary leaders kind of despite their motivations for initially getting involved you know, because when you look at, like, these revolutionary waves in, like, the Revolutions podcast, there's a lot of things to be depressed about. And you yeah. really have to take a philosophical point of view to not just, like, be disgusted at, like, say, the political leadership of these revolutions, the kinds of people they were, and the things that they did, just on, like, a sort of interpersonal level or a, like, an ethical level because they're they're just fucking opportunists so i wouldn't go so far as to say it's like a cunning of history argument but like sometimes if you look at the big picture they do actually achieve worthwhile things even though like you get somebody like marat or like yeah i mean especially marat who's just like 
you know, a very gross person, you know, yeah. personally speaking. Yeah. Yeah, but like, you know, maybe like maybe what's most objectionable is that like, okay, so they're useful for like a class or something and, you know, they bring about a big social change and then the class can just dispense with them and move on, right? No, the class gets no. tired. And the, the worst thing this person does is leave the new legacy of domination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But you like, th so that's why you like, in order to see anything positive in it, you have to look at the like, sort of change that's wrought, like one, two, three generations down the line. Because when you look at the particulars of the, the revolutionary leadership, it's often incredibly depressing what you see. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's pretty straightforward that the traditional revolutionary process is never going to produce classless society. There would have to be something rather different than the kinds of things covered on Revolutions podcasts. To the extent that that's possible, like is is sort of about how there could be, you know, more long term kind of distributed effort and energy in these like super de from these super democratic moments. We know they're possible at one point. You know, and then, mm -hmm. I mean, opportunists in those circumstances are instrumental in whittling down the solidarity necessary to keep things going. And people are going to get tired anyway, but people get tired quicker when they yeah. feel like the shit's being jammed and it's not worth going to. Like, like how the Soviets got hollowed out so fast. Yeah. So, you know, anyway, this is all to say that this micro stuff does matter even in the upswing. Because, yeah, there's very, like, specific sorts of class configurations that come together in revolutionary moments. Yeah. And really wacky ones at times. Yeah, like the, uh, what was it, like, the, the the sort of mania that sees the, 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 the French ruling class, like, at the start of the French Revolution, where there's, like, we must abolish ourselves! <laughs> you know, like just just absolutely manic uh, right. revolutionary zeal from people, you know, militating against their own class positions. That more was... of that, more of this. Well, like what was in the water? Those mean something in the water. Fantastic. What, what did they put in the gas? <laughs> the garlic. 